just by way of introduction, perhaps, um, of course, we're here in Bonn and, uh, and here in the climate uh, conversation, we're tackling everything. Um, in fact, there are thousands of conversations going on, which is probably why there are not so many people here. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do today is to really focus very much on the um, agricultural system and particularly um, look at this from a, uh, um, from a systemic point of view. Um, if you think about um, where we need to be by 2020 and then where we need to be by 2050, um, and, uh, and as the CEO of Mission 2020 running a, a global campaign on, on tipping points that we need to reach by 2020, if I think about where we are across the whole system. In the energy system, amazing the transformation that we're making uh, and we've made in the last 10 years. I mean, I, I was just at a meeting uh, with the Coal Phase-Out Alliance and Michael, Lieb Michael Liebrich was talking about the, the cost reductions in renewables uh, there, dramatic reductions, tenfold reductions in, in a very short space of time. In the transport sector, you know, all of the major um, uh, producers of uh, vehicles moving to 100% electric vehicles. Uh, cities, you know, 7,500 cities all around the world committed to taking climate action under the Global Covenant of Mayors. Incredible momentum. Um, in the other sectors, uh, I should say also in financing, amazing sort of things happening in the finance sector. The, the really big challenging uh, sectors are in the land sector and in heavy industry. So it's great that we can get into this here on this panel. Um, I'm gonna start by um, introducing our panelists. And uh, we're very lucky to have an excellent group of panelists here. I'm gonna start from Martin, um, Martin Köhler, um, Director for Consumer Protection and Product Security Innovation at the Federal Ministry <coughs> of Food and Agriculture here in Bonn, Germany. Um, we also have uh, Craig McKenzie, um, who is the chairman of the Precision Agriculture Association of New Zealand and actually is a real farmer. Um, so we're, we're proud to have a farmer um, on, on our panel today. Um, then um, from the Food and Agricultural Organization, Henning, uh, Henning Steinfeld, uh, Livestock Energy and Development uh, Initiative Coordinator with the FAO. Um, and, uh, and next to him, we have Stella uh, Thomas, who's the Managing Director of the Global Water Fund. And last but not least, we have uh, uh, Bernhard, um, your surname Bernhard is Stormer, Stormer, yeah? um, Head of Sustainability Management uh, with Yarra International. So thank you everyone for joining the panel and um, I'm gonna invite um, first, uh, if that's okay, um, to have Henning just give us a bit of a big picture view on the agricultural um, sector coming from the FAO. I think you um, uh, can bring that perspective and it'd be great if you can give us sort of what is the context in which we're, um, uh, uh, we need to see the agricultural um, sector. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we know now that agriculture is a, is a major emitter of, of greenhouse gases, but it is also the, the main victim of, of um, climate change. And I would just like to stress a few points where I think that agriculture is different from other sectors and maybe why agriculture needs to be treated differently in the climate change discussion. So the first thing is that agriculture is a biological process. So we are relying on photosynthesis, we are relying on the metabolism of, of, of animals. We are not producing this ourselves. We are engaging organisms to produce food for us. And that is quite significant because this food production happens in, in a myriad of different situations and therefore we have an enormous diversity of food production. If you look at all the forms of crop production, livestock production, forestry, fisheries, all this is done very differently in different parts of the world from very extensive forms, merely opportunistically harvesting fruits in the forest to intensive forms of fish tanks and greenhouses and and poultry farms which resemble industrial production. So there's a big myriad, a wide range of different conditions that, uh, under which we produce food with our organisms that uh, we've, we've bred and we've cultivated for that purpose. Uh, that also means that there's no other economic sector that is equally exposed to climate change. And here I, I, I would like to stress, it is not the absolute change. It is not the two or three or four degrees more that are worrisome. What is the most worrisome 
is the variability that is engaged in this process. So if we have successful agriculture now, it's because for the last 10,000 years we've had what they call the Goldilocks condition, a relatively stable, benign environment where we did not have massive disruptions of the climate. Now, if we are now going into major disruption of the climate, we can really screw up agriculture in a big way. It can really suffer in a way, and I don't think we have any guarantee that there will not be big disruptions. Mm. So we must look at that as well. And maybe even more important than reducing emissions is how do we cope in order to produce food security? Now, the question here is how do you optimize food production? Uh, up there, I think, somewhere. And optimizing food production needs to factor in the human need for food. And it is really food security or f healthy diets that ultimately are the, are the objective of producing food. And uh, so I would very much stress the idea that it is healthy diets that we should be after. And we need to organize agriculture and shape our agriculture and climate change in a way that we get to that point. Maybe last not but least, I want to factor in also the fact that we have about 815 people, million people that are food insecure, that are chronically hungry, a number that went up from last year, according to our estimates, and it, the reasons why it went up are first conflict and second climate change. So we already see the impact of climate change in terms of affecting the livelihoods of people. So from the FAO point of view, we are particularly concerned about those who do not eat enough and who have who risk of becoming victims of climate change because they're immediately exposed to the vagaries of, of climate change. Yeah. Bernard, you, you're involved in many partnerships um, uh, in, in across the world, um, in many different parts of the world and different sectors of the um, agricultural industries. Um, where do you see the uh, interesting uh, innovations that are happening, the opportunities across the whole sort of systems approach to, to agriculture? Well, first, I, I would just like to, to second what came from FAO because the agricultural land use and food systems are, are not delivering what we need them to deliver. Just take land degradation as an example. We lose some 15 million hectares of uh, agricultural land every year to degradation. So every three years, that's, uh, that's agricultural land the size of the, the German country. So we, we need to significantly, significantly change uh, the way the land use, food and agricultural systems are, are working. And I think there are some, some signs to optimism coming these days. Uh, one example is that agriculture has now been formally adopted by the Substack Committee in the climate negotiations. That's a, a very good piece of news. Secondly, there are now more and more reports coming looking into how we can have large-scale systems interventions to try to mitigate emissions from the agricultural sector and to have interventions to make land use a carbon sink. Some of those interventions are fairly easily to, to create like afforestation and reforestation, which can be a substantial carbon sink it just needs to be incentivized and formalized inside a political economical system. Second, we can avoid land degradation and land use change, which will spare the world for significant greenhouse gas emissions. This is something that we have technical knowledge about, but we really need to find a way to incentivize the farmers in adopting best farming practices. Because unless we have an economical and a political framework that actually supports the farmers in doing the right thing, we are not going to get to scale fast enough to deliver what we need to get from the food and agricultural systems. Yeah. And I'd like to come back to this financing question um, and some of the, um, the um, good cases of, of that a little bit later. Um, Craig, you're um, uh, working on the ground, um, part of this um, amazing set of innovators known as farmers. Um, Tell us a little bit about um, uh, your perspective coming from New Zealand, but also sort of um, part of that global uh, community of farmers. Um, yeah, I, I think we've, we've had some real challenges along the way. Farmers are always trying to do the best they can, but sometimes don't always realise what that is. Um, I think you're right around we need to be in food optimisation and, and production optimisation of our production and our systems um, 
technology has a large part to play in that, but at the same time, not everybody knows how to use new technology. So there's, we've got some real challenges. Um, from a New Zealand point of view, we are an unsubsidised country, so incentivising things is something that's a little bit um, against our culture in the, since the late, late 80s. So we've been driven by production gains as much as we could, and, but sometimes production's um, vanity and profit sanity, and, and when we have an opportunity to be able to be more profitable, we have the ability to be able to invest in more technology and, and probably make some significant gains. There's, um, there are some technology challenges, it's complicated at times, um, so I not, I'm not sure uh, what, what the exact answer is, but I think the, the previous two comments I, I think are both on the money with where we need to go. Um, we need to be a lot more efficient per kilogram produced, but um, if we can stop degradation of land and use the inputs a lot more efficiently, then I think we will, will go a long way down that track. We were talking before about the importance of focusing on water uh, in particular, um, and um, perhaps we can come back to that a little bit later, but Stella, this is your area of expertise. So um, from your point of view, where do you see the, um, <coughs> the water challenge and what are the sort of innovations and opportunities there to really be, be much more water um, sensitive and, and uh, efficient? Thank you, Andrew. Um, good afternoon. Um, yes. Um, my frustration is that we look at agriculture, we delink it separately from the world economy. And we have to take a systemic view of um, agriculture and link it into energy and water production. Um, uh, you know, we have, uh, in the next 12 years, we have a couple billion people who will be uh, added to our world population, which also means that um, there is a greater need for land use and also a greater need f to grow food. And where are we going to get this extra land? Where are we going to get this extra food? And where are we going to get the water to grow this extra food when so many of our uh, water systems have been so polluted or are scarce? Uh, so we have to really think about the water food energy nexus and think of a systemic viewpoint because um, as, as societies come online such as India and China who have enormous populations to f fill, their, their um, uh, standards are being raised and so they demand a more Western diet which is more energy uh, and water intensive. So for example, a plate of beef will, um, uh, uh, will take 10, 11,000 liters of water versus rice which uh, consumes 1,500 liters of water. So we have to look at the water footprint of our food. And, and then in regards to that, we also have to look at the trade in food, the virtual water, the water that's embedded in our food systems. So if, if I'm in a country such as Saudi Arabia and I had uh, an ancient aquifer, which is now, which has been depleted, and I'm growing in an unsustainable crop, which is really sucking up all my water, and I'm exporting it for feed, um, I've used up my water supplies for my own people. So what do I do? I go to your country and buy up your land and use the land and the water in your land and then I affect your country. So this is what's been going on. There's been relationships between China and Brazil and there's been relationships between the Middle East and various countries in Africa. So this is something that's been going on even in the United States, the breadbasket of the world. We have the Ogallala Aquifer and um, it's from the north of Dakota all the way down to Texas and some 60% of it, there are estimates that it's disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so how will we feed the world going forward. And we have to remember that when we think of water, water is um is, is a limit, okay, it's the same water that we have, but along the way, we are polluting it, we're adding nutrients, we're adding fertilizers, uh, pesticides, we're all kinds of, uh, we have a lot of problems with antibiotics and birth control and all kinds of things, so, and we're sharing the same uh, uh, water sources with our drinking water supply, our industrial, and our agriculture. Uh, and around the world, uh, agriculture takes up 70 to 90% of a country's water use. Uh, industry is about 10 and then the rest is basically about uh, uh, domestic use. So we have to really think about what, how are we going to look at 
agriculture in a systemic way where we are also thinking about the water and also the energy to move that water and to make those products that are, are there to grow our agriculture. Um, and so this is what keeps me up at night because I look at these things systemically and I see where there's been so much overuse of water and I see there's, there's lack of food over here. And then I also see in places like America, we have abundant food, but it's wasteful and there are no nutrients. So we're, we have high cases of diabetes and all kinds of other illnesses, which is another issue. Um, but there is enough uh, food to feed our growing populations. We just have to be smarter about it. We have to measure it and we have to think about it in a systemic way. Martin, let's get into that on the food waste side because we were talking a lot about that you know, a little bit before. I, I love it how you've connected across those different sectors, but also good for us to think about both the supply side and also the, um, the, the demand side. And so, um, Martin, what would you say about um, the, the challenge of food waste and, and other sort of consumer perspectives on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, first uh, of all, I would uh, like to thank you for being here in Bonn because I'm a Bonner and it's <laughs> very nice for us to have you all here from different countries. It's a very good experience. Well, um, let me say in Germany, the greenhouse gas emissions have been sinking from the agricultural sector since the 90s at about 19 percent. But uh, I won't deny the responsibility for, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions in total, even from the agricultural sector, of course. And one of the reasons, uh, or one of the things we are dealing with is uh, instead food waste and loss. Um, there's a high percentage of food waste and loss in, uh, in Germany um, through the whole uh, food chain. And we have started a, uh, a campaign, which is called uh, to too good for, for the bin. Uh, well, this is one of, of the papers uh, where you can get it from the, from the website of the ministry. And um, we are uh, financing uh, research projects. We are running these, uh, these campaigns. And it's, it's a very big issue. It has even been a big issue in the G20 meeting of uh, all the experts right now in Germany. And I think we will uh, cooperate with uh, different countries on different levels on this issue. This is not just a consumer issue in itself, it's also a supply chain issue. Um, so um, some of you perhaps have some experience of, of that. Um, could you, um, Bernard, say a little bit about the sort of innovations that are happening in supply chains and what we can do there? I think this also comes uh, comes a little bit back to the political economy in, in a sense. This is, well, not exactly about food waste and loss, but partly so. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, the farmers are very much challenged to keep up their productivity, even to feed their families. Uh, but then you have the trouble that you, <coughs> if you make an agricultural intervention, you run the risk of actually succeeding. So if you multiply production in an area many times over, uh, the risk is that the local market prices simply collapse because there's nobody to buy the added produce and then the farmers are maybe even worse off than before because they are indebted and they have nothing to sell. Uh, and this is where I would like to hail uh, someone like the World Food Program uh, who have realized that it's really a bad idea to save the same millions of people over and over again. So they established the patient procurement platform to, uh, to purchase the food that they need as aid from smallholder farmers so that they can actually help the farmers get an income to reinvest into their farms. So through this platform, uh, we as Yara, Rabobank, Bayer, and some other companies have formed a partnership <coughs> called Farm to Market. And here, we as private sector companies can work together with the farmers to help them multiply their productivity. But rather than having them oversupply the local markets, this <coughs> means that the, the World Food Program is the guaranteed off-taker of that produce so that the farmers can actually have an income to reinvest into their farms. So what this does is, is basically two things. On the one hand, it builds resilience for the farmers because rather than being at a subsistence level, they actually become part of the formal economy. So they have income and they can invest. They can educate their kids and improve their livelihoods. On the other hand, you avoid the trouble of 
food uh, loss post harvest or, or on the field in situations where you don't even have a market for, for this produce. So I think it's by thinking this end-to-end -end value chain integration, integration of how you work with farmers to improve practices is really the way that we need to work to, to help do this. And the World Food Program, they, <coughs> they have uh, the ambition of reaching out to two million smallholders over the course of a few years. So I, I would really like to salute them for, for this ambition. Yeah. And just a, a, a similar point going to the water topic is, is exactly <coughs> much as the same uh, dynamics are, are happening on, on water. Uh, we have <coughs> de developed a, a crop water sensor that can help the farmers fine tune exactly when they have to turn on their irrigation systems when the crops become thirsty so that they need the water. But this is picking up very, very slowly in the market. And, and the basic reason why is that water is so cheap. So even if we can help them reduce the water consumption by 15, 20, even 30 percent, it doesn't make economical sense to the farmers. So, so there's a disconnect between the resources we are consuming and, and, the, and the overall uh, economic system that we are living in. Mm. You're putting um, humans at the centre of that, which I love, but um, uh, what, what would you say, Stella, in relation to the solutions? I'd love also to come to um, Henning and, uh, and, and also to Craig after that. Yeah, thank you, and I love what you're talking about, Bernard. Um, I'm very hopeful um, for the agriculture industry and for what it can do f in various countries in Africa because, um, and I really think that's what's going to help lift up the economy because so much of the farmland, there's so many individual farmers. So this sort of a program where you're forming coalitions or you're getting some sort of sovereign uh, guarantee or some sort of international uh, guarantee uh, to stabilize prices is something that is the first thing that needs to happen because that is the problem. Energy and water are so subsidized that it doesn't make sense to, to do it otherwise. Um, and also, of course, you need to teach farmers about, you know, you don't flood your fields because it's going to dry out the soil more. We have to look at more uh, soil uh, water, soil retention um, conditioners and so forth um, to keep up the fertility and not strip all of our, our water, uh, our soils and so forth. So, I mean, there's a lot of learning to, to happen there. But I think what will help us, though, are a lot of these new technologies, these digi digital technologies. And what's exciting about um, working with some of these farmers in Kenya and Tanzania and so forth is that all you need is a, a simple cell phone and just not even a, a smartphone, just a basic phone. And I've seen a lot of different applications right now where um, uh, farmers are being alerted of weather conditions and, and so forth. Uh, and I've seen, you know, not all of them have worked, but there's a lot of trial and, and error that's happening right now. But you don't really need the internet connection either. So there's some services where, like Facebook does, where you don't actually need the internet connection to actually um, talk to other farmers. So I've seen that happen. And I think that's really what's going to help, is, is the data, the information. And, um, and, and, and I see that there's coalitions of farmers on the ground because they're so, um, you know, this is a life or death situation for them. They're going to be the first ones to grab onto this and run with it. And so I find that very exciting. Um, and we really need to support that. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of um, uh, agriculture investments we can make, such as drip irrigation and so forth. Um, but having said that, when we talk about the technology, on the other side of things, we have to look at the governance issue. Um, and the reason for that is because I, I don't want to name any countries or any organizations, but for example, there was this one uh, country um, in Africa that received let's say $100 million from a, a non-governmental or, or a, a, a big bank, a multilateral bank, and to develop their land and water and agriculture, to develop their agriculture. And they turned around and they sold that same piece of land to one of the countries in the Middle East who gave them the exact same amount of money. So the people in that country lost all that productivity, all that food, all that water, and so forth. So when we talk about land, we talked about the energy and the water everything embedded. We talk about livelihood and humanity, so we have to keep that at the heart of this discussion. Yeah. Henning, we want to build on that a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think structurally we have a, the biggest issue in agriculture is that we have a, um, a mixture between private goods and common pool resources, and that for the common pool resources, farmers are not paying a fair price. They're not getting a fair price for their produce either, but the problem of incentives 
is that some of these inputs just come without any costs. Water, you've mentioned that, so the only price you pay is actually the, the cost of extraction, of, of pumping it. But you also have grazing land. The majority of grazing land, even in developed countries, is public property, or crown land, as I call it in some parts of the world. So you can actually use that without being charged. The same with forests. So you're having a, a large area where you appropriate resources for private gain, and you're creating externalities which are a damage to the society. Mm. Now, the incentive structure is totally flawed. Mm. There's no encouragement for efficient your water use. There's no encouragement for letting, uh, stopping erosion. There's no encouragement for making good use of carbon or soil carbon. Mm. So that's really a systemic problem in many parts of the world, that the incentive structure, the price signals that farmers need to take into account in order to become efficient. No one is be interested in becoming efficient if there's not a gain anywhere. Yeah. So it, that is really a big, a big problem. That said, uh, we are seeing that the biggest potential to uh, reduce emissions and also to become more productive is, the, is what we call emission intensity and also uh, an attractive concept for developing countries because they can still grow their production if at the same time the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of product either managed, either managed or me measured in monetary terms or in physical terms goes down. So what we are seeing, for example, is a, a cow that in India, in Rajasthan, gives a, a thousand liters of milk per lactation. The average emission of a liter of milk is six kilograms of CO2 equivalent. You move that to, to what the neighbor does in the same area you know, of slightly improved management methods, with better feeding, with better husbandry, better health care. You go to 3,000 liters of milk per cow, and your emissions, your emission intensity per liter of milk actually drops by more than half. Mm -hmm. So you go from 6 to 2.5 or 3. Yeah. So that's where the biggest gains are to be made in terms of emissions. And that is a good thing because it combines productivity with emission intensity, so you're getting actually both. Yeah. You're getting higher production, better income, and, and lower emissions. If only you get the incentives right to get this process going. And that is a mixture of pricing, it's regulation, it's, it's awareness building, it's uh, research and development, it's training, extension, and so on. Yeah. The second big area which uh, is coming up quite rapidly is what we also discussed before, is soil organic carbon. Uh, not only as a store of, of carbon dioxide, as uh, we think sometimes, but as a productive resource. The agriculture does not function without carbon in the soil. It is an essential nutrient. It doesn't really work without. So whatever can be done in, in terms of bringing in more organic carbon into the soil, restoration of grasslands, uh, planting please, or composting, fertilizing, all these things. Vegetation, bringing vegetation back to areas where we lost it. Mm. And, and the third area, which uh, Martin has mentioned, is, is uh, the whole circular economy uh, and trying to bring agriculture more explicitly into, into the recovering and recycling of biomass and nutrients and energy that we call the bioeconomy and in particular the use of, of waste and, and losses in other productive forms. Yeah. Not let it become waste, but turn it into value, into feed, into fertilizer, into fuel, into something else, but don't throw it away. Yeah. Um, Craig, as a, as a highly efficient um, uh, farmer um, and a practitioner, um, uh, how do you see that big, cha that big next step? Because uh, once you get to that level of efficiency, you can drive that down and down and down further, but um, where do you go from there? So, um, that's a good question, but if I could just go back a step around um, what are the incentives. Now, we currently don't pay for water in New Zealand, so it's a public property and nobody owns the water, so we're having some political debate around that. But um, what, what actually makes an incentive? So, we are not incentivised to save water, we're not incentivised to uh, save electricity, but yet what we did was we've actually spatially mapped all of the soils on our farms. Every individual sprinkler on our irrigators, when you look at large centre pivots, is individually managed. 
we apply, we've got soil moisture probes all across our farms in every spatial zone, and maybe this is more than most would do, but, um, and then we apply water accordingly to what the crop requires, exactly what Bernard was talking about. Um, but we also have invested in, as a scheme and as individual farmers, we've taken the water, we've put it into pipes, we've pressurised the water, and we've actually saved in our particular scheme enough energy annually for 3,000 houses. Now, none of that was incentivised, and it's all paid for by us as farmers, and not all the farmers are doing what we're doing. But if we were actually paying for water, we can only spend the money once. So we're either going to spend the money on a, a water tax effectively, or we're gonna spend it on technology that it gives us a better environmental outcome. So we now have four years worth of data in our growing season to show that we've never had any water leave the root zone of our crops on our cropping farm. If you haven't had water leave the root zone, you haven't had nitrogen leave the root zone. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're not actually putting nitrates in the groundwater. We're only using what we want, what we need. We're saving between 30 and 40% of our water annually, and we've saved all of that energy. Now, I've done that because we want to be the best at what we can be. So I don't need incentives to, to drive me, and I don't need taxes to drive me. And we play rugby in New Zealand against Australia, and we are the best in the world, I have to say. But um, those, those players, are, and it's no different to any other professional side, they're paid money to play, but they're not paid money to win. They're out there to do the best that they can do. So this is an attitude thing. Somehow we've got to turn this around to where we're trying to change behaviour. And some incentives in developing countries I think will be useful. And sometimes there needs to be some stick and some carrot. And I think you're exactly right, this is a mixed model. But if we put too many um, price mechanisms as far as input costs are concerned, then we'll drive a perverse behaviour. And sometimes you'll water or you own more water. So then it gets back to what you talked about. So you've now got an asset because you've got a water right. And when you've got a water right and an asset and it's tied to the land, now you've actually just incentivised somebody to sell it at a profit. And I'm not sure that that's the right incentive to drive change of behaviour. And I, I said to a, one of the guys in, in, from England, I was with the chief scientist the other day from the G20, and he said, oh, carbon tax will fix it. I said, really? I said, so you're from England. You have the highest fuel tax, fuel price probably nearly in the world. If you put it up by 10 cents a litre today, it would be painful. Tomorrow it's kind of, well, we've just got to fill the car up with fuel. But actually, would that ever change anybody from driving at 140 kilometres an hour down their freeways? No, because that's what they do, and that's, they do it for a reason. So somehow we have to change some other behaviours apart from tax cause, and costs on inputs, because I don't think that will have the right outcome. Yeah, I think, we, I think the, there's a universal sort of learning over, over decades that we need to have a, a sort of multi-pronged approach to policy. Um, of course, getting the prices right is one part of it, but you know, investing in R&D um, and, and other sort of uh, 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 other mechanisms, other policy mechanisms are, are important to, to complement that. Martin, you come from a very different perspective, don't you, in Germany and in Europe on the whole question of um, agriculture and subsidies, incentives. Um, how do you see the policy challenges um, uh, where uh, Germany has a very ambitious long-term uh, goals? Uh, what, what is it, uh, what is it, what is the German sort of outlook, the European outlook um, for uh, agriculture and policy? Yeah, Andrew, you're right. And the European Union is now discussing a new uh, agriculture policy for the next uh, uh, decades, let's say. It's the, the common agriculture policy. And uh, different from New Zealand, our farmers are living with the subsidies. <laughs> and um, of course, they, they like it, and they like them uh, high, uh, to keep them high. Uh, I would like to say something about incentives. Henning was talking about the incentives, and I would like to present the, uh, as an example, the organic farming, the biological production. Uh, as we see in Germany, uh, the demand is rising for uh, biological products, so the prices are rising. And more and more farms are changing from the conventional production into the biological uh, production. And that uh, 
helps us to reach the goal to uh, have more uh, organic carbon into to put it into to keep it or put it into into the soil. This is uh, one example. On the other hand, we are exporting lots of meat into the world, increasing uh, masses, commodities, uh, meat and or poultry, whatever beef. Uh, in Germany, people are eating less meat, so there are more vegetarian uh, dietaries uh, coming up, ve vegan also. And, um, but uh, the demand for the German meat, because of the high quality, I assume, uh, abroad is, is increasing. That what You were talking about the changing of dietaries in India and in, in other countries, and uh, this makes me a little uh, reluctant or not so hopeful to, uh, to decrease even the water consumption or, uh, or the carbon uh, emission. But incentives are a very uh, important thing, and I think we should m put more attention uh, on this, on research and on campaigns and on changing behaviors. I've heard um, someone the other day tell me that the cow is the new coal, um, at least in some uh, cultural contexts that it seems to be the case. There's a, a lot of people moving to, um, to reduce meat or eliminate meat entirely from their diet. Stella. Can I just say something that, which is encouraging? There's uh, three companies in San Francisco right now that are actually producing protein-based meat plant protein, and I was a bit suspicious of it myself, and I tried it, and I couldn't believe that it wasn't meat, so that's where I'm putting my money. <laughs> okay, well, I, I hear that the cost of that is coming down uh, significantly, so let's see what happens. I think there's this, a very significant social dimension um, to that. Um, so I could just, I, I guess I didn't actually answer your question before around um, efficiency, where we are today and where we, where we can go. One of the things that water does do for us is it allows us to use a lot of inputs but very strategically. If we didn't have the water to back those up then we couldn't actually be as efficient as we are today because we can really manage what our inputs are and match it to exactly what the crop requires. So, And, and when you talked about 70 to 90 percent and 70 percent is the number I hear that um, agriculture uses globally, we have to be a lot more efficient with that. So the challenge for us is maybe the crops that we grow rather than, and we've, we may end up with more incremental benefits than where we are today. We've made some massive gains, but going forward it may well be different crops and, um, and, and other incremental uh, benefits. And, but I think there's some real environmental benefits for farmers generally to clean up what we do. So I'd like to take the opportunity to invite some um, interaction with our audience. Um, would anyone like to ask a question of any of our panel here? We'll take several questions. Um, we first have um, this lady at the front here. Uh, hi, this is Sepide Dottobar. Uh, thank you for your insights and, and very nice uh, discussion. Um, the only thing that I'm missing here is the role of the government. Um, uh, I know that, for example, in Holland, um, one eats only chicken breast and all the wings and legs um, go to uh, Africa and other parts of the world and uh, be dumped there. And because of huge, huge European um, uh, subsidies for, for the meat and chicken, they can ask for a few cents per kilogram, by which all the um, foreigners in, in, in Africa cannot compete with this um, meat coming for almost free. but. Um, then we have a polluted country in Holland. The air is bad. Uh, we don't know what to do with the residuals and, and, and the transportation. What, where I'm missing the role of the government or a European community in this one. Okay. Um, let's just take another uh, question and then we'll, we'll ask the panel to respond. Um, I'm coming from the country where, <coughs> where agri-companies are not necessarily collaborating and sometimes very 
destructive for communities and the and the habitats, especially uh, with the agri waste. And could you provide your maybe favorite approaches and examples to the policies uh, pushing uh, food producers, agribusinesses into more circular supply chains and calibrating horizontally so they are creating more integrated flow of uh, resources between them and um, uh, providing even ecosystem services. Thank you. And one more question just here. Hi, Jane Oyugi, um, Sustainable Company Limited in Tanzania. Uh, my question is, um, I'd like to get your comments around um, hydroponic agriculture, so the ability to grow plants and food um, with water as opposed to, especially in places where there is not enough land anymore and there's not even enough water to, you know, to, for the plants, for the planting. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts and if, if that's an alternative in countries like Tanzania or other sub-Saharan countries. Thank you. And, and there may be even a connect, the Dutch connection here because hydroponics is huge in the, in the Netherlands. Um, but questions around um, governance, the role of government, um, and drivers for supply chain innovations and circular economy. So, um, well, firstly, Stella and then Bernhard. Okay, um, I guess I'll address the governance question, the first question, thank you for that question. Uh, I guess we're sitting here, uh, here on stage and really talking about developed agriculture, developed markets. And, um, and I think this is, you know, we need to address our, our, our southern friends uh, because it's very trendy right now. As, for example, in Detroit, uh, in the U.S., which is being uh, being revived, it's now trendy to have uh, vertical farms right in the city center. And we see all kinds of examples in Brussels and Singapore and so forth where all this urban agriculture is taking place, which is wonderful. But what is really happening to our southern friends? And what we forget about, um, about is that a lot of um, farmers are losing, are selling out their land to industry. So for example, in China, um, where you had so much growth in India, uh, so much growth in industry, um, it would, a farmer would get about, um, I think it was $14 for uh, a, a ton, a thousand tons of wheat, but that same piece of land can yield $14,000 <coughs> to industry. So, so, you know, there's that happening there. Then when we go to move down to, you know, countries in Africa, we have to remember that there's a lot of competing uh, resources. There's uh, nine, 10, countries of the Chad River Basin are completely dependent on that water for that agriculture. So where this is happening is these farmers don't have access to that water or there's competing competition with tourism and all kinds of other industries. And this um, is going to cause a huge a bigger problem than what we see today. As we know, Syria, it was a clash between herders and pastoralists. It all started over, you know, agriculture, no water. I mean, that's where all these 60 million um, refugees in the world, most of it came because these countries were so reliant on agriculture and all of a sudden they didn't have access to that. Or we look at a country like uh, uh, with Egypt and, and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is building a dam um, which might disrupt Egypt's um, agriculture. So that's why government is uh, really is the only one who really can address that right now. We have to come in with specific technologies and we have to be part of the process and we have to bring in the investment community and the multilaterals and so forth. But we have to think of these in a holistic way and what, um, you know, how we can ensure our, our security, our national and human security. Thanks, uh, uh, I would like to, to connect the first two questions to one of the points that was made by, by Henning on how we really are sub subtracting from natural resources and we are doing it for free. Uh, we are members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and within WBCSD uh, there's work being done on something called the Natural Capital Protocol. And this work is about <coughs> companies agreeing on how we measure the use of external resources into our processes so that we can report upon them and ultimately also embed uh, the cost of extracting those new, uh, natural resources into the market. So ultimately, <coughs> this is, is uh, a, a very small starting point for what may become uh, an internalization of such externalities into the markets. 
And I think that if we as consumers would have to pay the true price of water depletion, of carbon emissions, of waste being <coughs> dislocated where it should not be for all the products we consume, I think that would give a very powerful incentive towards more sustainable consumption, but in, in, or importantly also for companies to deliver more sustainable solutions to the customers and to work to build more sustainable supply chains. So, <coughs> so to this circular economy point and aspect of that, the first thing you do when you want to be circular is really to reduce losses. To arrive at zero waste is, is really one of the key items of being circular. So if you, <coughs> we come from the fertilizer industry, so if we look at what is happening in Europe, European farmers have improved the efficiency in the use of fertilizer by 20 percentage points over the past couple of decades. And that's very impressive when you consider that the farmers are, are doing this just by managing biological systems in a better way. But we see in our scientific trials that we can boost this productivity by another 20 percentage points. Uh, and that is a, a significant contribution towards a more circular system. And by the way, we are also working on innovation for waste management and seeing how that can also be <laughs> captured and, and reused as nutrients. So, but that's innovation for the future. Currently, we're doing work on efficiency. Thanks. And where do you see the, the future then, given that um, we do need to kind of move to full decarbonisation for the fertiliser industry? Will we, where, will we be moving to um, uh, completely, al al completely different alternatives? Uh, how do we close that loop and what's the role of government in, in helping to facilitate that? Well, I think first of all, the private sector needs to have a mutual platform on how we incorporate the externalities. Mm. But then if the private sector agrees on how to do this, it can be regulated. And if we get the right price incentives, we will do the right thing. But then this is also about innovation and strategy, and this is about us as companies not becoming the dinosaurs which are extinct in five or 10 or 20 years. We need to be willing to innovate and renew our business models so that we are part of the solution for the future and not part of the problem of the present. Um, Henning, um, wouldn't, would, would you be able to also um, give us your perspective from FAO's point of view on where you see the role of government in, in this transition? Um, uh, what's your sort of perspective on um, the, the role of government versus the role of private sector partnerships, um, leadership from the private sector? I think it would be fair to say that um, the past has been characterized by a, a policy void around many of these issues, an institutional void uh, when it comes to deforestation, degradation, pollution, and so on. In many countries, this has not been addressed at all. I think in Europe, it is quite different. You're a forerunner here, but the rest of the world is really lagging much behind in terms of addressing these environmental issues and climate change also. I think what was mentioned previously about the Substa Committee now having come up with very concrete themes and recommendations as to how to implement these ideas and connecting the IPCC with a, a, a better and more concrete string of activities that takes this forward is, is a great encouragement. Uh, I, from the livestock point of view, it is obvious that uh, much can be done, must be done by uh, regulating waste control, regulating um, uh, water use and pollution, um, disease, of course, uh, you know, all these things that we need to have in terms of having good, good food and sustainably produced food. So uh, unfortunately, particularly in these rapidly growing areas of agriculture, like meat, but also fisheries or aquaculture, regulations tend to lag behind particularly in developing countries where sometimes there's a very rapid commercial development of certain products, but it takes time for that to be taken up. So we would, uh, we would see that uh, a stronger role for governments, but be acutely aware 
that on sometimes controversial issues like the livestock sector, you need a societal con consensus, you know, like you're trying to do this in Germany. Animal welfare is important here, but it's not very important in other countries. Uh, and of course, you know, there are different cultural issues around cows in India and all this, so it's very specific what needs to be done. But it is important that whatever happens in agriculture is carried by a broad societal consensus, and therefore we very much work through multi-stakeholder mechanisms in order to take the hot air out of the discussion and get on with something concretely that can be done and where you have a consensus and where you can actually agree on, on joint action. Uh, these are the most promising elements because it is really so complex that you need a, a host of different agencies and players involved in decision making and in transmitting messages so that they uh, translate into change. I'd like to hear from Craig and Martin, and then um, also let's get into this question on hydropon hydroponics as well. So it would be good to come to that question as well. So the, there needs to be some, um, from a farmer's view, probably don't ever want to have government involved <laughs> in re some regulation. But from my, my point of view, I think there needs to be some incentives and some, some regulation. The risk that you run is that it will stifle innovation. So the very leading farmers are actually sometimes ahead of the scientists, and sometimes the scientists actually get threatened by that. But if we actually put too much regulation in place, then we won't actually get all of the benefits that we possibly could do. So we need to work collaboratively together um, and be careful not to put in a ceiling that stops that innovation. Um, and, and I guess um, the scary bit is that it's not seen as a community problem. So we're talking a little bit around charging for resources or charging for water. And I'm not sure what happens in other countries in the world, but I certainly know in New Zealand, people in our urban communities think that they pay for water, but actually they only pay for the infrastructure and the maintenance on the, on the, pay for the maintenance on the infrastructure that the water runs in. So their water resource is also free. And if we want to drive efficiency, then we need to do that across the board with everybody. So it's got to be a collaborative approach or we're going to get, as we see a little bit in our country, of everybody standing in their corners pointing the finger at somebody else and it's somebody else's problem. Well, globally, as we move to more urbanised communities, that divide between the rural um, world and the, and the urban world is, and we see that in the, you know, the uh, political dynamics in, in some countries, uh, it's a very important issue to bridge. Um, Martin, how do you see this um, question? You're from uh, the German government, so you uh, have... So as I'm from the government, I see the role of government as very important. <laughs> now, uh, let me put a, show an example about regulation. We had this... Uh, uh, we, had, we wanted to, uh, to uh, support renewable energies, of course, like for electricity and so on, and uh, then we, uh, the government did some regulation to, to, to pay more for uh, the kilowatt for, from uh, renewable energy, and farmers started to, uh, to grow corn for biogas uh, installations. And then we had all these biogas installations all over the country, which is nice, but the corn <laughs> was too much. So we had a kind of monoculture in uh, growing corns. And this is an example that you uh, even can uh, regulate something maybe or give some incentives in the wrong way uh, because it's not for sustainable agriculture it's not or for the environment it's not very favorite to have uh, all over the country uh, corn corn fields uh, for the pigs it's, it's very nice <laughs> and we had uh, big damages in, in the forests also so i mean you have to to be very careful uh, about regulation but uh, at the end you cannot live without and especially in the food sector. I mean, as food safety is, is a very big issue in, in Germany. And uh, we had uh, some scandals in, in the past. Uh, of course, you always have a scandal sometimes about EHEC and uh, the BSE crisis is very well uh, known. So there must be some regulation and precautionary principle, uh, of course, but uh, you have to be uh, careful. And uh, also, uh, the, the question that we had on uh, hydroponics. I, I think that hydroponics is an incredibly 
exciting area and an area where we're seeing quite a bit of innovation going on these days. And I, I would just like to share an example from, um, uh, it, it's another company slash NGO that is, it's a startup, uh, but we, we've done a pilot together with them and it's a really intriguing combination of technologies. So it's called the Sahara Forest Project. And basically what this is, <coughs> is um, a concentrated solar power plant that is being used to power an installation that pulls salt water from the sea and vaporizes it to get rid of, of the salt. And then the humid air, the, the fumes are pulled through a, a greenhouse where you collect the fresh water and use it <coughs> to irrigate uh, your, your crops. Uh, and inside this greenhouse, you have a hydroponic system that typically produces uh, um, tomatoes or cucumbers or any high-end cash crops. And as a result, you get some excess energy. You get uh, a surplus of fresh water. And you are probably carbon neutral because you actually bind CO2 in your crops in the process. And by adding so much humidity, you also have an opportunity to, to use that for regenerative growth in the immediate area around the greenhouse. So, so this is, is just an example on, on how you can combine existing technologies to create very efficient systems. So, so I think the, the hydroponics is clearly an area to be, to be further explored. Excellent. I mean, I would like to wrap up on that note, actually, because uh, we, we only have a few minutes left, and I'd like to thank the panelists. Um, but if you could finish off with uh, your sort of light to the future, where do you see the, um, the, the, the pathway, the, the one thing that you think is a really breakthrough um, opportunity or, or something that you see um, with, with a great op uh, potential to, um, to help solve this um, transition that the agricultural sector needs to go through? Stella. Um, uh, two things. I'm, I think the future is here when it comes to waste treatment. Uh, there are many examples where nutrients have already been extracted. Um, of course, pathogens are, you know, are a, a concern for agriculture, but there is a company in Austria who's been able to, uh, to demonstrate that they can burn that and apply it to agriculture, and they've had some successful trials. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate for waste water for the agriculture. And the other thing that I'm excited about is um, uh, empowering the, the farmers on the ground with digital technologies, information, and knowledge. And if we start there, um, then perhaps we can move on to, you know, um, better government governance and uh, better investment as well. Thank you. So, Henning, what's exciting you about um, the well, future? Uh, of course, I look more at the sort of global perspective. And, and for me, it's not so much the front end technology that is it's interesting cellular agriculture, hydroponics, uh, synthetic meat, and all these are interesting developments and promising developments. But the biggest gain is to be made from closing the efficiency gap or the yield gap, which uh, is in certain parts of the world really, really big, as I've tried to explain with the Indian example before. Mm -hmm. So both in terms of productivity and, and uh, sustaining rural population, but also reducing, uh, relatively at least, emission intensity. For me, that is the, the biggest area of action, um, both in terms of policies, but also in terms of investments and, and getting, getting technology, existing technology, which can double and triple production very easily in some places. Yeah. So if you're looking at quick gains, they are to be made there. That's not to say that we should not have front-end research, but uh, if you look at the scale of the problem globally, it's in the existing technology gap and productivity and if you want emission intensity gap that we are going to see the, the, biggest, the biggest potential. Yeah, because this is fundamentally a development um, and livelihoods and uh, poverty alleviation challenge. That's right. Challenge. <clears throat> That's one package. Craig. Um, so I, I guess a couple of things. Um, one, we talked about hyd hydroponics and, and you talked about for the high end products and probably organics probably fit in the same space and you talked about at the start of having more starving people globally so those two things potentially if they're high-end products they aren't going to fill that gap so that's a concern we need to close the gap on production otherwise and I think probably the most exciting thing for me would be able to get 
uh, uptake and adoption of the current technology that's there today. We have to be able to look into the future, but actually, if we're always looking into the future, we'll never get there. So we have to make sure that we use what's here today. There's some exciting stuff there today for efficiency gains that we just need to get on the ground and get used. And finally, Martin, what's, what's going to light up the world? For well, for, for Germany or maybe Central Europe, uh, innovation and research is very important, but even abroad, even for, for the world, because I, I, last week I was uh, participating on the conference Science for Peace in, in Jordan, and there were 2,500 scientists gathering together from all, all over the world, and it was exciting what the results of the, all these uh, scientific projects are, mainly regarding water management, but even other issues. And, uh, uh, well, not too long, but the other one is uh, changing the behavior, the dietary behavior. I mean, uh, eating less meat is more healthy, is my opinion. And uh, so that means uh, that would help to solve some uh, water, water problems and greenhouse gas problems also. And uh, increasing the productivity, of course, is very important, but even uh, the food loss and waste is uh, an issue we should concentrate on and deliver this. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have finished with our time, but um, uh, I would really like you to um, put your hands together for our wonderful panel. It's been a great conversation. Thank you.